Good evening. And first of all, I'm going to disappoint. This isn't a Sydney, Australia accent, as you may already have worked out. Um, however, let me first of all um, give a quick plug for IIC. Uh, we are the leading uh, professional organisation in the conservation space. We've got about uh, uh, we've got f distinguished fellows and members in 70 countries around the world. We publish the main technical publication in the space, Studies in Conservation. We run wonderful congresses. Our next is in Edinburgh on built heritage in November. Uh, it promises to be an absolute cracker of a conference. Um, and above all, we communicate the profession. And we do that particularly through our bi-monthly free e-magazine um, called News in Conservation. Our inspirational editor, Shara Groh, is here tonight. Uh, do sign up. It's, it really summarizes what's happening around the world in a way nothing else is. And we run Point of the Matter Dialogues. So without more ado, welcome to the IC's Point of the Matter Dialogue on heritage and climate. And let us introduce our panel members who will now join us. Can I introduce, ladies and gentlemen, in order, Sarah Sutton, the Principal of Sustainable Museums, Nora Lokshin, the Senior Conservator of Smithsonian Institution Archives, Julianne Polanco, California's State Historic Preservation Officer, Andrew Potts, the Coordinator of the ICOMOS Climate Change and Heritage Working Group, Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth Macmillan Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and finally, Alison Tickle, the director of Julie's Bicycle. As you know, I live in Australia, and we have seen this Australian summer a bushfire season of a scale and intensity that we have never seen before. The stats alone speak of 72,000 square miles of land burnt out, 34 lives lost, 5,900 buildings, and a staggering estimated one billion animals and birds killed. With this, a number of Aboriginal sites, historic sites, and at least two museums, along with countless personal items, treasured items, have been lost. Hans Rosling wrote a book in 2018, which was a New York Times bestseller, called Factfulness, and a number of you may know it. Apart from predicting the greatest threat to humanity was an outbreak of flu for which there was no known vaccine, um, his line is that if you dig into the statistics, things on a whole range of measures are better than we generally think they are. And certainly after our last two days here, I am optimistic. It's great to see the aptly named Earth Optimism Summit will be here, as Stephanie said, at the Smithsonian in April. However, that optimism depends on at least three things. First of all, and this all comes from our last two days here, all hands on deck, folks. Everyone has a part to play. We all need to find our voice, whether it is personally or institutionally. Secondly, we need to bridge the gap between concern and engagement. And thirdly, we need to be flexible and adaptable. Nothing is stable. For example, as we heard from Scott Miller in the opening address yesterday, forest ecosystems that always appeared to be stable are now very unstable. We heard from Isabel of archaeological sites, which we've always thought would be there forever, collapsing. And we know the people of Tuvalu, whose land is subsiding underneath the waves in the Pacific, who say they can no longer read the sky or the seas in terms of what it tells them. So, without more ado, in this spirit of optimism, let me hand over to our panel. I was going to introduce them as a bunch of optimists, but um, I ran that past them and they all said, look, we wouldn't be here unless we are optimistic, but I will let them speak to that themselves. So they're going to introduce themselves, and first of all, I'd ask Alison Tickle to talk to the issue and to introduce herself. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Do you mind if I move a bit like that? Do, please. So, first of all, thank you all very much for um, having me both um, now, but also for the last two days. They have indeed been uh, really rich um, and, uh, and very inspirational, um, full of fantastic content and, and ideas. So, my name is Alison Tickell. I'm the founder of a, an, an organisation called Julie's Bicycle, if anybody wants to know why 
we'll take that offline. I can <laughs> fill you in later. Um, but uh, I'd like to start out just by um, just tweaking our curiosity about why it is that after decades, indeed centuries, of knowing about climate change, both its causes and its consequences, and obviously there's been a, a huge acceleration of that knowledge, um, we still are where we are, which is at a, 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 an extraordinary tipping point. If Earth were a clock, we would be seconds, seven seconds from midnight. And we have now got ourselves into a, a, a real pickle with this, which, where we've got a, a structure, a, a global structure, which is, take, is going to take a huge amount of ingenuity, effort, goodwill, generosity, um, and 100% concerted focus and action to turn it round. So why is that? When we have had, uh, particularly since uh, the Rio summit in the early 90s, when we have um, brought to bear politics, technology, science into this space, and we're still not there. And the big area that has been missing and has been a terrible omission is culture cultural heritage, culture and the arts, because this is fundamentally a human problem. And it's going to take us all as human beings to solve it. So it is baffling that it has taken such a long time for us to recognize that this is ours to recognize, to acknowledge, and to start to drive, around, drive change around. Um, so the, the, the issue around culture is culture is as, is as culpable as it is uh, it has the potential to change. It's the myths and the metaphors and the narratives and the stories that we've told ourselves that have brought us to this place. I come from a country that uh, birthed the Industrial Revolution, and on the back of that and a, a set of stories that we have told ourselves, um, we built an empire which has been profoundly destructive in all sorts of ways, and that now really does need to be dismantled if we're going to change into from a very extractive culture to a regenerative culture, which is what we need to do. And we need culture and the arts to disrupt those myths and those narratives. That's why we set, I, I founded Julie's Bicycle, um, and it was the idea, the ethos behind it for, uh, um, was always to provide a place for people to go from the arts and culture. We have a simple philosophy that if we change culture, culture can change the world. And I think that's true of many people that I've been with, had the great privilege of being with over the last two days. Uh, and we've systematically set about the last 12 years trying to find actionable answers to the question, well, what can I do? And that means that we've focused a lot on energy, on water, on waste, on environmental impacts, but also on resources, on networks, on building community, on campaigning. Anything that anybody has asked us, we have tried to find with them answers for action, because climate action is so critical. Um, just a little moment took place in 2012 when our Arts Council England, which is our national funding body, required all the organisations that they fund, some 830 of them, to have an environmental uh, impact uh, measurement every year, an environmental policy and an action plan as a funding requirement. And that's changed again in the UK because it has meant that everybody has become environmentally literate. Everybody has committed to action. And the fantastic thing about it is that it's created much, much richer, much more um, uh, ambitious and creative responses. And it just does show that if you all come to the same place um, and the same kind of encounter, and you go on that same journey of knowledge and understanding, that creates huge creativity and imagination. So now there's all sorts of things happening. And our work has, it ranges from, from right across the piece to campaigning, to creative commissioning, to governance, to uh, uh, maintaining that focus on, on, on how we reduce our environmental impacts. The last thing I want to say is this is all about movement building. It's about, it's about how we come together, how we, we counteract 
the many forces and the many actions and the many preventative measures that are constraining this. And this is all about diversity. It's about understanding that we all have agency. We are all creative. We need to come together. And the arts and cultural heritage, more than any other sector, has got that diversity, that capacity to, for companionship wherever you are, at any point in your journey, to speak in different languages, to feel the work in different way, in the world in different ways, and actually come together in that purposeful job. It is the only job that we have, it is the only purpose that we have in the world. Um, and thank you all for being here, because I'm sure you're part of it, part of the solution. Thank you. Alison, thank you. Anthea. Thank you so much, um, and thank you, Alison. You're a hard act to follow. Fortunately, I've heard you a little bit before and been inspired by you. Um, I have the honor of serving, as you know, at the, at the National Museum of American History. We know a little bit, too, about building empires because we took a couple pages, um, as you know, uh, from your book. And, um, and that's, I think, part of, as you know, part of all of our, our issues and our understandings. I've been, uh, and on June 4th, uh, randomly, I will celebrate 30 years um, as a public historian working in historic preservation, um, teaching, um, thinking about ways in which we um, save intangible, intangible resources, movable and immovable, how we think about oral traditions and our, um, our sacred sites, and I've grown increasingly to blur the lines that separate and define our resource types. Um, and I think that one of the most important things that has certainly come out of our work together as colleagues um, is to understand the interdependencies of all of our lives, of all of our creativity, and certainly of all of our cultural production. Um, I then approach this as a historian still, um, and now I have an 800,000 square foot building I'm trying to steward uh, with millions and millions and millions of objects and artifacts in a very susceptible part of the National Mall on behalf of the American people. And, um, but as a historian, one of the things I'd like to kind of interject into the conversation um, is both the, what I see are these critical trends in museum studies, um, as well as critical studies in terms of decolonization and understanding the ways in which we try and um, come to a restorative place of working towards that justice, how that inter then interacts with our built environments, with the collections we steward, um, and then bringing it back to how it interacts with the environment and bringing, I think, weaving into the conversation, um, which has never been lost, I, I don't think, but perhaps can be subterranean, a notion of environmental justice. The climate crisis conversation in the end, too, I think relies on a sense of um, understanding the inequities that we've inherited and the, the ways in which our patterns of ancient life along waterways, um, and coastal communities, all the way up through our modern um, discriminatory land use patterns have meant that the most vulnerable communities um, to climate change are the most vulnerable communities, especially indigenous black and brown communities um, as, that are also the, the, their frail envir uh, uh, culturally and economically. Um, I'm grateful to my new colleague, Felicia Bell, who found this incredible uh, panel that maybe some of you saw on, on C-SPAN a couple of years ago, looking at the intersections of climate change and environmental justice. Um, four years ago, 46% of the American public couldn't respond to a $400 emergency. So when we think about vulnerable populations, um, who can't respond to a $400 emergency, kind of, I think we need to layer in how we're going to help people respond to true climate emergencies, um, environmental emergencies. And we don't, I think we, we focus, and I am right there, about disaster planning around objects and around property. But in the end, they also need to be around people. We're, we're so blessed that we I steward people's stories in the end, and people's histories. Um, and, 
I think now increasingly about the ways in which those histories and communities um, align and the loss that we face if we don't, as you said, come together and recognize the power of those, um, of those communities and of those stories um, and weave them into the way in which we document what we save, whom we save, um, the way in which in our capacities as, um, as museums, the way in which we tell those stories, craft our exhibitions, our educational programs, um, and what we can do uh, to harness that. So I am a cautious optimist um, uh, because I actually believe in, in, our, in the power that you uh, that you noted, um, Allison, to unleash our agency. But first, I think we also need to acknowledge um, that agency is something that has been withheld, you know, to so many for so long. And um, it's a joy to be able to be up here with these incredible people. I'm going to turn my time over to my dear colleague, Andrew. But I do want to say quickly how honored I've been to be a part of Andrew and, and Julianne and so many others' work as we think about the Climate Heritage Network across uh, across the world. Um, and as we open up our spaces, like you did today, um, Stephanie, to have these conversations uh, and then to know that we're not alone as we carry them forth. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Andrew. Well, thank you, Julian. I, I want to say that I'm humbled to be included in this panel with, with given the accomplishment of my co-panelists. Um, as you heard, I uh, work at ECOMOS. It's the International Council on Monuments and Sites. It's a non-governmental organization based in Paris devoted to heritage safeguarding. And at ECOMOS, I coordinate climate change and cultural heritage programs. And so I spend a lot of my time with climate scientists and climate policymakers trying to convince them that arts, culture, and heritage uh, are relevant to their work. But I have to tell you, I spend as much time, if not more, with friends and colleagues in arts, culture, and heritage, trying to convince them that the things they're passionate about, the things they know how to do, are relevant to climate action. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought I would use my few minutes to share with you two anecdotes about how I personally came to be working at the intersection of cultural heritage and climate change. And not because I think my story is extraordinary, but in fact, uh, for exactly the opposite reason. I think it's quite an ordinary story, and hopefully it will convince you, if you're not already convinced, that the passion you have, the expertise you have, the interest you have in culture is highly relevant to climate action. Uh, so first anecdote, I, um, I went to, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I went to law school with the goal of being a historic preservation lawyer. That's, that's actually a thing. Um, I, I, my, my mother and grandmother, this is back in Indiana, are both historians, and I credit them for that. So I graduated from law school in the early 90s. It was at the depths of the AIDS plague. And I found work as a lawyer helping to put together subsidized financing for the adaptive reuse of historic buildings for HIV AIDS housing. And from that, I, I developed a law practice uh, in um, historic preservation finance, mostly adaptive reuse of historic buildings for affordable housing. And so my clients were often involved in campaigns to save buildings from the wrecking ball uh, so they could adaptively reuse them. And at some point, I came to be sensitized to the environmental benefits of building reuse, thanks to the work of pioneering people like Carl Elefante and Jean Caroon and um, Ralph Danolo, uh, Bob Selman, who since passed away. And I was struck by the fact that even in campaigns that were sort of uh, you know, very robust, rarely were historic preservationists making these environmental arguments about why buildings should be reused. And, and I think those arguments are compelling, and so that struck me. And also I noticed there was not a lot of allyship between historic preservationists and climate activists, even on the central idea of just reusing buildings. And so um, this struck me, uh, this discrepancy. So that's anecdote one. And then the second anecdote is that uh, I said I come from Indiana. My family's from southern Indiana, which is coal country. And if you listen to voices from coal country, you know that there is a lot of anxiety about the contraction of the coal industry. And if you listen to those voices, uh, those folks often express their anxieties expressly in terms of heritage. They will say the loss of their heritage, the loss of multi-generational livelihoods, the loss of traditions of coal mining communities. 
Um, and uh, what struck me about that was, uh, despite the fact that those um, concerns were explicitly expressed in heritage terms, they were rarely validated by kind of the official instrumentalities of historic preservation. Um, they weren't taken at face value as heritage concerns. And I, I have since learned in the, in the climate world that there is, of course, this idea that the transformative change we need to go from a carbon economy to a post-carbon economy is going to be quite disruptive and tumultuous. And there will be a lot of communities that are upended. And that dislocation has to be attended to uh, for a couple reasons. First, because the, those communities deserve that, but also because if their precarity isn't addressed, uh, their responses to that can itself um, uh, upend climate action. And I felt like there was a real uh, obvious opportunity for historic preservation to be relevant here in terms of documenting and memorializing the traditions and the contributions of these communities, valorizing their contributions to, the, to prior economies. And yet I didn't know very many colleagues who were doing that kind of work. And so you sort of see a, a trend here of places where I felt like there was a big opportunity for historic preservation to be a part of climate action, but uh, I didn't see that potential being fulfilled. So fast forward to today. Um, um, last year, uh, Anthea alluded to this, about 75 international, national, and local arts, culture, and heritage organizations launched a thing called the Climate Heritage Network. It's a network of folks interested in those fields who, who want to be in dialogue about how we can mobilize culture for climate action and how we can use what we're good at to advance climate action. You can find out about it at www.climateheritage.org. Julian asked us if we're optimistic. I am cautiously optimistic. I am I'm concerned that in the middle of a climate emergency, so many prominent cultural institutions are behaving with business as usual. Mm. But every step we take to mobilize arts, cultural, and heritage for climate action, including tonight, uh, increases my optimism. So thank you. Julianne. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I sit here before you honored and um, privileged to be California's State Historical Preservation Officer, but I am here today as a daughter and a wife and a friend and a colleague. And I feel abundantly pleased and proud to be with this amazing group of people and all of you who've inspired us over the last couple of days in this particular um, session to continue the conversation of the intersection of culture and climate change. I was asked earlier about optimism. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with some graduate students early this year at the, or earlier this week at the University of Pennsylvania, and the director asked me, you seem so excited about climate change. Um, <laughs> and, and then the second question was, doesn't the magnitude of it frighten you? Um, and I'm excited about the prospect of working with smart, capable, and thoughtful colleagues who have thought about things that I have no capacity to, mm -hmm. like the scientists who can calculate carbon reduction, mm -hmm. and the architects who know the history of buildings, and our friends who work with our indigenous communities to make sure that everybody's voice is heard. And I think that's the strength and the superpower that culture brings to the climate change conversation, and every one of us at this dais and all of you in the room have that capacity as well and so together we're stronger and that's my optimism. In California, we are very blessed to be able to work on a new initiative called the California Cultural Resources Climate Change Task Force. And it's chaired by my office with colleagues in the arts and the humanities, our environmental colleagues in the resources and EPA agencies, air, water, all media, to work together to understand where culture can play a role and um, adding to ambition and where culture also can play a role in helping change behavior. So how do we add social cohesion in the realm of climate change and who better to do it than people who are embedded in culture? 
Um, I grew up in a very uh, small rural community where you learned to drive with one hand on the wheel and the other hand out the window because you knew that so whoever passed you by was your teacher or your best friend's parent or the person that tattled on you for cutting school. Um, <laughs> But in an emergency, everybody worked together to make sure that we were all looked after. And I think that we are doing that on, on a scale level locally in California with our task force and globally with the Climate Heritage Network. We're looking at how we find these ambitions, how we work together, and how we listen to our local communities to make sure that their voices are also represented and that we're tying these global conversations to local people in a way that allows everybody in and everybody to be present to contribute. I'm going to finish with one story. And when we started our task force two years ago, um, California's cultural leaders have all gathered together in an informal cabinet. So the state librarian, we have our tourism board with us. Um, Dear Anthea was with us at the California Historical Society when she was there. And we, we meet and we talk about how to collaborate together. And building upon that, um, the California Arts Council has a very lucrative grant program where two years ago they weren't in this space. And as I, call, I uh, called my colleagues for some really good examples, I learned of one after a fire in 2017 in Mendocino County. Um, the California Arts Council was able to fund a one-page grant that sort of was very quickly put together that created a mural out of things that people found in the rubble of their built out, burned out homes, businesses, places where they live, work, and play. And what ended up coming to fruition was a mural that was made by the community with things that they brought and then eventually installed um, on, a, on a Grange building, the community gathering place of a lot of rural communities are these kinds of veterans halls and Granges. But the story was a heart in the middle with beating hearts of the seven or eight children who passed away in the fire and of one of the mothers who said that she was absolutely stifled in making decisions. And by her experience of working on this mural, the idea of deciding whether blue or red went next to white gave her the courage to start making decisions on a small scale and then eventually starting to make life decisions that she needed to to carry on in the absence of her two dear children. And I think that is the power of culture that all of us can bring to this table with our non-traditional partners. And I think that that's the optimism that we carry forward when we leave here today in our daily work. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Julian. Nora. Wow. Um, yeah, all very hard acts to follow, as has been the, the discussions of the past uh, two days. So yes, hi. Um, so I am uh, what we optimistically call a mid-career conservator, um, having the daunting task of speaking from the voice of conservators, everyone, I don't know. Um, I hope I can do that. But I, I hope I can say that we're also realists, um, and it's not exclusive to be optimistic without tackling and realizing there are some very hard and challenging and negatives to, to deal with, but we have to get through this together. Um, I am fortunate and fortunate, I am very proud of the, the academic professionalism program that I came through as an emerging conservator, um, which quite recognized in, I'll, I'll say it's based in libraries and archives, uh, which has this unusual quality of acknowledging our stakeholders and uh, a factor of immediacy and use and access to collections and things that, that can be touched and go in and out of places for um, some types of collections. But we also were very deeply engaged in buildings and structures and how they physically worked and flowed and you know our, how our climates were managed. So we always had that sort of in mind and as a mature mid-career uh, conservator, I am finding this moment of reflection uh, in the past few years and that my voice is getting stronger um, in terms of looking back and, and re-examining those things that I was taught and when people come to us for ideas, uh, 
how we go about approaching what it is they really want and, and where can we meet and not thinking I have a prescriptive answer, but a listening one and, and, and accommodating one as well that serves all, all the factors that we're dealing with, whether the perspective of the object or the person who wants to examine and use and benefit from that object. And it is not exclusive to physical objects, um, but let me go back to this. I'm actually going to start the sort of round of slides that we're going. I also come from a background perspective as an illustrator. And icons and images promote ideas. And so I'm going to start with a few. Um, but it's not exclusive of visual um, because we also are storytellers. And that, that is what we do in the cultural heritage game often, is we transmit stories. So whether visual or oral or other past tradition, I'm going to just go ahead and see what I can tell you. And you might be a little surprised by some of them, <coughs> namely this. If, um, I'm going to also describe a little bit, because I'm not sure that this is going to transmit on our webcast. Um, so this is a very recent icon or image that has been passed around as a meme. Uh, it is a, a cartoon panel, the second panel of which is very, very well known. It's referred to as the This Is Fine Dog, or the This Is Fine Meme by Casey Green. And I went, I was, I've been thinking about this, I've been seeing it passed around a lot, and it describes uh, there's a small dog with a cup of coffee uh, incongruously on a table with a fire around the, the dog and the fire is increasing. And what most people don't know when they're circulating this image is that this is a part of a story. It is not just the one image, the second panel. It's a six panel cartoon and it, it goes on to the fire increasing and the dog simply drinking its coffee and it goes in the lower <laughs> section to some very uh, dire places, which I don't need to transmit to you. You can use your imagination or, or go look it up on the source at um, gunshowcomic.com. So this was issued in 2013, and it's, it's got a lot of relevance. And then here's another. I started thinking about images, and images in sequence or series or independent, and icons and ideas. And I started thinking about um, a lot of my friends have been really into the tarot lately. And the tarot, if you don't know, the game of tarot or the divination of soothsaying, predictive part of tarot. I found work by an artist uh, by the name of James Leonard um, fairly recently in 2016, did an interactive installation work. Uh, and I'll read the headline, uh, how a tarot reading helped me talk about climate change. And, and I found it. And that's how I figured how I could sit here and talk today. Um, the, the game of tarot focuses on images and symbols in what, what are called arcana, um, and it, call it divination or fortune telling. It's really a, a talking, motivating sort of, let's see, uh, it's a tool for talking. I mean, it's a tool for asking questions and finding answers and what those answers spring forth from association with those images. And so this artist used this in an installation at uh, Bushwick Open Studios in Brooklyn and you know, got a lot of people talking. Where else is the tarot being used? Um, I started thinking tarot conservation. Where is that going? And I did a little searching, and I find this um, in Colombia, the country of Colombia. The Humboldt Institute, uh, not too long ago, released a released a biodiversity tarot for conservation awareness, and that's what uh, conservation. We refer to our sister colleagues. I'm a conservator of cultural heritage and material objects, and we're talking about species and biodiversity conservation um, within their group. But they started looking at tarot and using it to explain and replace the arcana with threatened species to raise awareness and fundraise for their institute and to start talking to people. Why are these animals important to you? What are we doing about them? Um, that work is El Taro de la Biodiversidad by Pedro Ruiz and Maria Elvira Molano. And, and possibly still available um, in their gift shop and maybe online. So jumping tracks a little bit, um, conservators, generally are brought up to look at objects and be neutral in their approach to them in terms of one is not necessarily more valuable 
than another. We're all going to try and treat an object the same way, you know, be it, we, we try and approach them the same way and not value one object above another. However, that's really paradoxical because we are already doing something in a space that's reserved for them and a space that's collecting them and showing them to people based on certain values. And so I will uh, address this. A colleague of ours, a uh, dear colleague, uh, Fletcher Durant, posited this at last year's American Institute for Conservation. Um, this is the shorter title of his longer talk, but essentially hashtag, uh, we started some conversations about conservation is not neutral. And this was in the context of a discussion on implicit bias, power, and what we are collecting, what we are showing. We're already working on certain selected items and stories and whose stories we are telling and who is doing the work and whose voices are in the conservation or in the conversation about the conservation um, and showing them this work. So that's something we're talking about. So how do I get back to us and this panel? Part of it is here's a, yet another wonderful uh, new tarot um, by a group called Superflux called Instant Archetypes, a new tarot for the new normal. And they've replaced one of the major, or sorry, minor arcana, I think, um, called the Hierophant with the Academy. And we in this room, for the most part, I don't know everybody in this room, but hi, welcome, hi, on the web. Um, but the people who have been gathered here today are the Academy. We, some of us teach, some of us lead museums, some of us keep museums open for the people, but we are this elite, we're in this particular space. And we say things and sometimes people listen and people call us and say, what do I do? What temperature do I need? What relative humidity? Which things should I buy? Which should I keep? And in a session that happened at the Smithsonian in, in 2013, um, uh, another dear colleague, James Riley, uh, let me just read this there, because I picked, they replaced the Hierophant with the Academy as, uh, as an icon. And I'll read the, the pull quote from this. The Academy works out ways to kill monsters and makes new monsters in the process. And uh, Going back to our friend uh, Jim Riley, he did a really lovely talk where he got everybody's attention by killing, trying a little, showing a, an image of a, a little zombie uh, or a little vampire and about how we were trying to kill the zombie of the perfect, you know, 70% uh, or 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity and that we had to kill that energy sucking vampire dead because listen, it was the energy sucking vampire. We were, we were known for one thing and one thing only and not differences. So we're now starting to think about killing our monsters that we created. And I think that's a helpful motif. And that's my roundup a little bit. So where are we now? If we go back and where's Casey Green three years later in 2016 issues this comic and the fourth panel says the little dog surrounded by fire is screaming, this is not fine. So I ask myself, and, and I ask you all, are we fine? Do we think we're fine? I, I, I posit that we are not fine, I agree. So that's why we're here, trying to be optimistic about change. And uh, so seeing another tarot and conservation relationship uh, in my searches, I found this article, very recent, published um, in IIC's uh, Studies in Conservation, a planned and preventive uh, conservation project for the Tarot Garden by Nikki de saint -Fall. Uh, by uh, Serena Vela and Carlino Gaetani and Ulderico Santa Maria. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit of the quote that's on the screen, but this is a, a, an abstract describing the will of the artist. It was to replace tiles as they were worn and, and decaying and just being a constant replacement. And these authors suggest perhaps an alternative. Perhaps they propose conserving them or at least prolonging their lifespan. So slowing down, looking at another avenue to go forward and how can we do that better? It's not necessarily just going one way. And that's, that's a bit shocking because it's going against the will of the artist. But the fact is, is the, the artist also acknowledges that this, live, this work will live long beyond her and it must continue in some way. So we have to find that compromise. 
so lastly, um, I pulled a few cards from the deck. Uh, this is by no means a proper Taro layout. Um, these are chosen and selected by me of the many uh, faces of the suits. But I leave you with some ideas to ponder. And one, and also the, 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 the words on the cards do not necessarily express all the attributes of the card when you're uh, looking at the taro. But they can start thinking about ideas. And so I read them to you. Temperance, justice, we've heard a lot about that in our conversations. Strength, which we need for the world. So or read them in a different order. They can be presented in a different order, but those are things that I am starting to motivate with. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. So I want to talk to you about our impact. We are only just beginning, I would say, to embrace our impact as museums, as cultural institutions, on um, the environment. And we're only beginning to embrace the potential of our impact on creating change. So as a field, as we get ready to do this, this is what we've got. 35,000 museums in the United States, $50 billion to the GDP, 850 million visitors we touch annually. If we faced our greenhouse gas emissions, if we faced our opportunities to engage and educate so many people, we could not ignore that responsibility anymore. This is a quick review of what we've done in the last 20 years. And I'll read for those who are far away. 20,000 in the 2000s, lead buildings and green exhibits started. 2006 to 09, there was a series of articles in Museum, also known as Museum News during part of that, about environment and museums. The IIC's roundtable on that plus minus d dilemma, 50-70, um, in 2010, I have, whoops, my math is off. 2008, the AAM's Environment and Climate Network was born, and it was originally called Pick Green, a profess professional interest committee on sustainability. In 2015, the US announced its intention to step out of the Paris Agreement. Um, no, 2015, we had a Paris Agreement, sorry. 2017, we announced our intention to step out of the Paris Agreement. In 2018, cultural institutions banded together in the, in the United States and joined something called We Are Still In. In the same year that Andrew and Julianne are pulling together the Climate Heritage Network. In 2019, the ICOM gathering um, in Kyoto just a few months ago, um, they adopted sustainability and the 2030 agenda as their responsibility and the next few years of work. It took us two decades to get here, but I feel like we are really ready to rock and roll, finally. I would, uh, honest to goodness, I was saying backstage, within the last three months, something has changed. I can't describe it, I can't tell you where it's coming from, but oh my gosh, I can feel it. And there are days where it's overwhelming, but overwhelming in a positive way. And part of the reason I feel so positive is because you're looking at the to-do list for the field just for the next year. That's as long as the, that one that's list before was two decades long. The, uh, when I was at the Western Museums Association Conference this last fall, an entire room of people asked, where are we in the discussion about the plus minus dilemma of 70 degrees plus or minus two, 50% humidity plus or minus five as our range. We know that it's been adopted in many places, adopted by ICOM. It is the zombie that we have to kill. And the conversation is ready to be restarted, to reset where it was, where it is at the moment, and what we know about it, and how to use that conservation science to move forward in a way that changes our carbon impact, and helps us do a better job of taking care of all of our collections that we're here for. The second one is that the National Endowment for the Humanities has given an implementation work to uh, grant to AIC to create a life cycle assessment tool and a library to help collections professionals make informed choices about the environmental and health impacts of the materials they use to care for collections, to share them, and particularly to ship them around the world. 
We're also going to be chasing a one-day bench press, is what we're calling it. On the 1st of June, we're asking all of those who have not yet measured their operational energy use in a museum, a cultural institution in the United States, to measure it that day and to share it with us so that we can collect all of that energy impact and be able to measure our greenhouse gas emissions so that we can't ignore this anymore. In Climate Week in September, when the world comes to New York City and they're talking about environment and climate issues, museums and cultural institutions will be there as part of that conversation. And we'll be encouraging other organizations around the United States to be having those conversations at home with their peers and colleagues about what's our role in addressing environment and climate. And then we are still in. So we are still in is the largest coalition of organizations and people anywhere in the world in support of the Paris Agreement. They include at the moment 80 cultural institutions who have signed on in order to support those goals. And we continue to gather people who are interested in contributing to this effort. But that didn't happen, you know, 20 years ago when this got start when we started making these changes. I was having to learn about how to do this work. These are the things that I've learned and that I hope that you will take with you if any of them resonate and you will engage with. I ask that you talk about climate change whenever you have the opportunity to anyone that you can have the conversation with. If we talk about it, we normalize it, and then we can share responsibility for tackling it. If you see something, do something about it, please. We all need to participate in creating these solutions. You who engage with this in your jobs, in your um, community roles, in your families, are the best suited to address that issue in that location. And together, you can address it on a much larger scale. We need to be creative, curious, and courageous all of the time. Because our original practices that got us into this mess are not going to get us out of it. We need a totally different approach. And you have to be brave. You have to be brave right now and try something different, even if you're not sure. And choose the difference that you will make to engage with us in changing the way we interact with the environment and how we picture the future that we're going to leave so that we create something where everyone and everything can thrive and do it through our museum cultural environmental work. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, what a fabulous uh, roundup of a whole range of issues. Um, am I still optimistic? Look, I think so, and thank you variously for addressing that. Let's open this to the floor. We've got two roving mics. Please make sure you wait till you get the mic, uh, because this is both being live streamed and recorded. And um, they are over there and over there. If you'd like to put up your hand, if you'd like to ask a question. Um, while you ponder that, uh, I might just fire a question initially to Alison, if I could. Um, you've been describing a particular situation around how the UK has been a very fertile ground for the work you inspirationally talked to us about yesterday and talked briefly today. How applicable is that more broadly outside the UK? So, um, the headline is that the climate and ecological crisis is a global crisis and it affects us all. And by the way, I, I do use that term very carefully because language matters and it's not about climate change, it's a climate emergency. Um, a lot of, the, we've always worked internationally. A lot of the international work is advocacy. But I think the, the, the lessons that we've learned, uh, we don't have time to reinvent the wheel and I think this is for everybody. Um, the movement building is about understanding what we share in common and what we can learn rapidly from one another so that we can accelerate and scale. And we need to be very adaptive and we need to be very open to, to uh, and generous to those changes. Um, so I think some of what we've learnt mm. will be, and is actually, because we, we are working internationally, is applicable. As long as we we all bring to that the capacity to really change the tone, the feel, the look, the but really focus on the on that 
common, common purpose. Because we don't have time to reinvent everything in the way that we might think otherwise. So I think much of it is applicable, much of it is we are learning from others, and it's about an attitude that we need to bring to this. Thank you. Have you got any questions out here at the moment? Uh, Alison, I'm wondering if you could talk about metrics and how uh, giving people the power of their own metrics and how that affects uh, their support for a climate change initiative. For sure. So um, metrics often have quite a hard time, actually, uh, because I think particularly in the world of the arts, people tend to feel that the metrics are reductive and they're not, they're not embracing uh, a, a, a field of creativity. However, metrics are absolutely fundamental, particularly in the context of climate impact, because the, there are many parts of the climate crisis and ecological crisis that are material. Everything counts. We're now at 412 parts of carbon per million. That's more carbon in the uh, atmosphere than we've had for t over two million years. So it's everything matters. Um, the other thing is that we can all take action if we understand this challenge better. That's, that's not contentious. And what we've found is that creating some simple but common carbon uh, environmental impact literacy allows you to understand yourself in relation to others. It allows you to prioritize. It allows you to be accountable to the work that you're doing in relation to your communities, the planet, um, and also in relation to what's good, bad, uh, and ugly practice. So the metrics have been uh, really critical. And they've also allowed us to be able to look at progress over time, to decouple growth from um, reduction, which is a very important part of this story. Um, they've given people that capacity to, 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 for agency, and I think this is really about agency. Um, and I think, so that thing that you said, Sarah, about asking everybody on your day to, you know, it's, it's very powerful stuff. It is not the only stuff. But it's the beginning of a journey, and, and I think if you can do that at scale with, co with a common approach, um, it, can be very, it can be very powerful. Could I leap in, um, Anthony, and perhaps just ask you a question? You raised the issue of this particular uh, climate change particularly affecting lower economic groups. How does that overlap with your experience as a National Museum director with trying to reach those groups separately, I suppose, with your own outreach? And is there lessons to be learned how we can do that? Um, thank you. Um, my, uh, my experience on the national level at, at the Smithsonian is only a year old, so a year and two weeks. And, um, <laughs> uh, but I was fortunate to work in our national trust here um, in the Western region um, and work from Guam um, and then the continental Western United States and, and throughout the United States. Um, I do think that the importance um, of a truly community first approach instead of, we, we tend to be very good at talking at people and doing things for them and on their behalf rather than actually truly engaging them in a conversation. Um, I think what we find uh, in our work is that the trust you need to build with communities to help not only bring forth, let's say, the, um, and honor their cultural heritage or their collections or their art um, starts, as we all know, with, with dialogue and discourse, um, but also understanding the contours of their own lives and the um, as I noted before, the fragility of, of many communities, but also honoring their resiliency. I do think that the, the ways in which um, communities, especially communities of color, rural communities have, we were talking before about coal country, and then and the conversation is, is often about heritage, mm -hmm. often about the, a sense of loss. Um, and then learning from what those communities have done to sustain themselves throughout inordinate cultural challenge and change um, and even depravity and loss. Um, 
And so I think there are many lessons within that kind of community, true kind of community outreach and working with, with communities that we've, I think we've found over and over again is, is incredibly powerful. Mm. Thank you. Sure. Um, we, we had discussion, Andrew, if I could pose a question to you, um, over the last two days, uh, preaching to a group of converts, really, um, uh, talking about the gap between concern and engagement. Mm -hmm. Outside this room, how, how big is that and, and how fast is it getting closer together? You're right in the middle of this. Um, uh, I'm going to, I work for a professional organization and I'm going to answer the question um, um, relative to a specific audience uh, instead of the general public. But in, uh, among, let me take as a, as a subset, professionals who manage heritage sites site managers, uh, park superintendents, uh, and the like. And uh, of course, m many of them are interested and concerned about climate change. But you may or may not be surprised to learn how many people have as their actual job the safeguarding of precious places, mm. but who haven't m meaningfully taken on board the implications of climate change. Um, it's not incorporated into the site management plan. It's, it's not addressed uh, in the infrastructure uh, planning, et cetera. And so um, these are people who live and breathe the idea of safeguarding a precious place for the next generation. And so they are certainly not indifferent mm -hmm. to the implications of climate change. But somehow the, the dots don't get connected. And um, one thing at ECOMOS that we have found um, that that um, changes people's um, attention is if you help them to actually s concretely, um, scientifically model the climate impacts for their locale. So if you downscale the climate modeling and you look at the precipitation patterns, the heat, the sea 20, 30 years from now, and people are often quite surprised to learn about the, the changes uh, that are expected. And even a few degrees uh, warmer uh, are, are quite significant. A city going to something like um, 60, 70, 80, 90 days of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit every day, mm. uh, a, uh, even a modest amount of sea level rise, upends people's planning, their contingencies, their budgeting. And so um, we have found one strategy among those types of professionals that, that influences that shift is to make concrete the impacts that are expected. And I think it speaks broadly to the power of place and the, the power of using familiar and beloved places um, to, to teach, as um, our colleague Marcy Rockman says, every place has a climate story. Yeah. And telling those climate stories connected to places that people value, people professionally manage is a good strategy. Thank you. We've got a uh, question up here. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much uh, in the interest of trying to be brave, one of the dictums. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'll try and keep it brief, but there's so much to say. The, this, the Superflex, um, I didn't know about the tariff, but uh, they, they have a piece which everybody should go online and, and search for it. They recreated a McDonald's. Um, this is a piece that's about 10 or 10 or more years old. They recreated a McDonald's, so you see everything. It's, it's perfectly recreated, and then they filled it with water. It's a sort of airtight container, and they filled it with water. It's a video work. It's really affecting. Um, so thank you. Uh, we're f I'm from Brooklyn. We come from New York. So this is really tremendous to, to be here today. Um, I, I'm from, you know, Hurricane Sandy made it clear that there will be neighborhoods that are going to be gone within a very short time. Um, Howard Beach, where my mom grew up, lots of places that are just going to be vacated. Um, so I'm wondering if um, maybe Andrew can speak to that. You know, I, I, I'm trying to imagine how to memorialize these places that don't have, there's nothing sort of monumental about them except for the lives and the, the histories of the people. Mm. Um, I also am fresh from a, we, we went to a march um, trying to save um, a stop on the Underground Railroad in downtown Brooklyn on uh, Duffield Street. So if you look for the hashtag Save227Duffield Street, 
there's a, it's a stop on the Underground Railroad. The city changed the name to Abolitionist Place. And it's a, a two-story sort of brick house that's surrounded by condos in downtown Brooklyn. The developer who owns it now, who got it from the family that was there for a long time, it, it sort of there's, there, there are really no obstacles except for the mayor's um, attention now, finally, uh, to knock it down. So we're, we, the community came out to try and save this place. Um, that had no real architectural features, no important you know, cornices or whatever. Uh, the landmarks preservation, they don't come in if it's culturally important, only if it's that's something that I learned, only if it's architecturally important. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, yeah Andrew, if you can like just talk about some of that stuff. Thank comment you. Comment on that. Well, I, I think a lot of the panelists may have something to say about, about the topic of loss, but uh, so I'll just make a brief um, observation, and that is uh, every system has an adaptive capacity, and when that adaptive capacity is reached, exceeded, then you have loss and damage to essential characteristics of the system. And in the context of heritage, it means the loss of heritage values, the loss of heritage attributes, it means the loss of whole sites, monuments. Um, and this is not only inevitable, based on the climate science, but already happening. I think in, in cultural heritage, it's against our nature to plan for loss. Uh, we, we, we plan uh, with the idea of losing nothing. Um, and um, we, we don't have the luxury of, of that kind of naive, naivete. Um, People expect us to be truthful and candid and vigilant about the fate of the culture we've been entrusted with, and that includes being candid and mature about talking to people about the prospects of loss. It means planning for loss. It's inevitable. I think the active process of planning for loss is extremely eye-opening to people and galvanizes climate action. Uh, I think that's important to say. And the last thing I'll observe is that um, obviously there's inequity everywhere, and we run the risk of magnifying inequities uh, as we fail to transparently and um, intentionally plan for loss, and we find in short-sighted measures whose culture and whose stories and whose heritage is taken care of and whose is not. And so the intentionality of planning for loss also um, helps, to some extent, uh, assure a more equitable process. Julianne, would you like to comment? Yes, I, I think that we could spend the entire day answering your question. Um, there are so many things to say, but I, I think that one of the things that we've been sort of milling about in the last couple of days and over the last couple of years and we'll certainly spend more time on is, how are we using tools to save places differently? What does that look like? And whose story are we talking about? And in the work we're doing in this task force in California, we're hoping that we have as many stories as our public tells us they want to know about. Whether it's intangible heritage, it's a sense of place, or whether it's the most unique architectural style of its time. Um, all of those values are important, and as, as preservationists, I think we need to accept that those are values that need to be considered with all the many other things that will have us in the same canoe rowing through sea change going forward, or climate change going forward. Um, so we have to get ready, like we would with any emergency. I don't know if you've ever lived in a place that, I remember spending summers with a friend on, in Rhode Island on the coast, and when the hurricane would come, they would board up the house, and then we'd unboard it when nothing happened. In California, we just go about our business until the ground shakes, and, and then we figure it out. But the days of preparing are on, are in our they're here, and it's challenging us to look at science and to look at 3D modeling and look at the different ways we have to use new tools to save a place, but maybe not in the way that we all think about it now. Um, and as long as we can work together to get prepared, and I think that's the optimism of this collective, is that everybody has a different way of doing something and when we can share and learn from one another and adapt those things to our needs locally, regionally, globally, we're ready. We'll be saving heritage and we'll be saving the places that are important to your mother and to my father in ways that maybe we're not looking at today but are equally important and that's going to sustain our communities regardless of what happens going forward. Thank you. We've got a question down here. 
Yes, I'll be very brief. Um, I actually have a comment and a question. The comment um, relates to um, Ms. Tickles about the bicycle, uh, Julie's bicycle, where she talked about um, the empire with uh, Britain. Um, I think there's been a, been a one great benefit of the empire, and that is the tra train. I think rail throughout the world uh, really came out of the UK, so I think you can be proud of that, thinking of India, Asia, United States, South Africa, everywhere. So please be proud of something about empire, okay? Um, and then my, my uh, question, it kind of relates to our uh, director at American History. I'm one of your volunteers, and also for um, Sarah Sutton at Sustainable Museums, and also um, our California State uh, Historic Preservation Officer, uh, Ms. Polanco. Um, I've been a longtime volunteer back uh, in the, starting in the 80s, and we used to have, make stuff uh, in the United States that we sold in our gift shop, for example. Uh, our t-shirts, our mugs, now they're all made in China. And so I think um, our museums uh, at Smithsonian can be a role model by making more stuff in the US. Like this museum, uh, Sam, they have a lot of local artists um, that they display. Um, and certainly, you know, African art, of course, you wanna help the African artists, right? So, but American history, maybe we could look back. Uh, we used to use GSA vendors um, blind, disabled, uh, but after the contract with America in 1996, then we moved to, um, you know, cost savings, so make everything in China. So anyway, that's, you know, kind of a suggestion. Uh, but also related to, um, for example, we have a lot of water bottles, um, you know, one-time use water bottles in all of the gift shops, all of the uh, cafeterias, but we do, uh, a lot of the museums, if not all, have now put in the, the water filter machines to fill up your own bottle. And related also to the sustaining uh, museums, you know, maybe we should really encourage all the museums to get rid of those one-use water bottles and have uh, the, the recycled bottles or, or, you know, recycled cups, things like that. And uh, I do work at Department of Interior, and it kind of relates to the California State Parks. Back under the previous administration, they got rid of all of the one-use water bottles in the national parks. Um, and uh, they only had reusable bottles, which was a great, uh, you know, cut down on trash, you know, recycling, helping America. Um, under the current administration, they got rid of that. But the visitors uh, overwhelmingly are still using, bringing their own bottles. So I didn't know if that was the case in California state parks, for example. So if you could check that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to comment from your position on that? I had the most remarkable time on Wednesday, I think, my days are running together here this week, Wednesday uh, to drop in at the Museum of Natural Heritage to spend the day with Eric Hollinger, who is a staff member, an anthropologist, who is absolutely a, a wonder and a force unto himself, and he has galvanized an amazing number of people at the institution and across the Smithsonian who are participating in a myriad of ways. And they are, and he worked very hard with the, um, I can't remember the name of the systems associates, but the, um, that work in the, that provide in the cafe, and he's worked with the gift shop for approach, coming up with better approaches to what they make available, where it comes from, and understanding how it connects to the mission and protection of the environment. So you're right, there's lots of work to be done, and there's a stunning amount of excellent work actually <coughs> happening. And the trick is that we need to share those successes a little more broadly, uh, lift up those people who are doing that work, make it part of their job descriptions and part of their responsibilities in order to spread it far and wide. So I have hope that we are making an impact. Anthea, do you want to comment? Oh, I just want to thank you for your, your comments and for your service, and I completely concur. On my first day on the job, I walked around and I stopped trying to count the number of places I saw single-use plastic. Um, I was told I was very California. I said, no, I'm very global. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, but you're right, we, we need to do better. I think all of us at the Smithsonian would agree. And then just think of the ways in which we, as one of the largest museum uh, and institute, uh, research institute complex, and the, including the zoo, where we could actually, and I think it's our, our duty to lead by example. 
So I pledge to, in front of all of you, and I know I'm joined here by lots of great colleagues uh, to continue to do better. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. The gentleman down here. My name is Wally Snyder. Um, you made a very strong case here for doing the right thing. And that really is an ethical proposition. And I really think that it would be very useful for us to think of this in terms of ethics. You know, for one sense, there is a strong scientific case that you're making. Uh, and we need to make that case to the right people who makes the decisions. There's also a personal case to be made here to the public. Those of us who have not experienced a disaster yet would need to have the feeling of doing the right thing. Ethicists will say that business case or the, or the scientific case is ruled by the brain. And that's very right, and it's important. They'll say that the personal case is ruled by the heart. And you know, Sarah, when you talked about be brave, stand up, I think part of that is really an ethical proposition. And we should really be maybe talking about that a little bit as well. Thank you, Sam. Anybody like to pick that up? I was just going to say that I think that you're correct, and it's also a human issue, right? We're 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 looking at the problems that we're helping that we've helped to create, and how we save ourselves. It's really about saving ourselves and saving our communities. Um, and I think that the more that we incorporate those ideas and those thoughts in the work that we're doing. Um, I will get back to you about your question about California State Parks, but I know San Francisco Airport banned single-use plastic. Major international airport, a shock to everybody that visits and wants something to drink, they now have to carry a bottle with them or purchase an aluminum bottle. But I think you're right, and how we, how we do that in a way that doesn't, um, that we're not speaking down to people, but we're including them is our task. Thank you. Now, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time because the museum is closing. Thank you for that final question. Um, that's not cutting you off. Um, could you please, first of all, join me in thanking our wonderful panel. The second thing to say is this is all going to be on the Smithsonian's YouTube channel, so you can capture it all there and relive it in all its multicolored glory um, and its optimism, and I put that out to you again. Um, but I, it remains me just now to thank the um, organizers of this, and particularly my dear friend, Vice President and Director of Communications at ISE, Amber Kirk. Amber, thank you again. And finally, Sam, for all their generosity in, in ha having this lovely auditorium for us. Um, sadly, we've got to move fairly fast because the uh, security guards are going to be going as well. But thank you, finally, for all your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.